My name is Cheryl, and I have a story to share. It all began when I was about six or seven years old. That's when my parents split up. My dad, Harold, couldn't handle things anymore. My mom, Isabella, had been on his case for years, always nagging him about not making enough money. She constantly put him down, making him feel worthless. I remember one time when dad came home so happy because he got a promotion at work. He had the biggest smile, feeling proud of himself for once, but mom just looked at him and said, that's it? I thought you had finally found a real job. I watched the joy drain from his face, it was like watching a balloon slowly deflate. Not long after that, dad left. Now that I'm older, I understand why, but back then, it felt like my whole world was crumbling. Mom saw his leaving as a chance. She quickly figured out how to use the poor single mother story to her advantage. She'd go to work and act all sad in front of her boss. I'm so sorry I'm late again, Mr. Frank, she'd say, wiping fake tears. Cheryl was sick, and I had no one to help. Mr. Frank would pat her hand and tell her not to worry, while I was actually just fine at home, watching cartoons while mom spent hours on her hair and makeup. Family gatherings were the worst. Mom would take center stage, dramatically telling everyone how dad abandoned us and left us with nothing. I'd squirm in my seat, knowing it wasn't true, but I never dared to speak up. Even at that age, I knew better than to make mom look bad in public. What nobody knew was that dad was sending money every month, child support, he called it. Whenever those checks came, mom would wave them in my face and say, look at this, Cheryl. Your father thinks this tiny amount is enough to raise a child. Pathetic. I didn't know how much it was supposed to be, only that it made her angry. And when mom was angry, my life got a lot harder. As I got older, I began to notice things, like the way mom would sometimes look at me. Her eyes would narrow, almost like she saw something she didn't like. Later, I realized it was because I looked too much like dad, and those memories weren't the happy kind for her. But she kept me around anyway. I was useful, you see. The image of the struggling single mom with her brave little girl was too good to resist. It got her sympathy, special treatment, and even some government help. But then, when I was about 10, everything changed again. Mom met Jack, rich, successful Jack. Suddenly, being a struggling single mom wasn't so appealing anymore. Now, she had a new role to play, the devoted wife of a successful businessman. And I didn't fit into that picture anymore. It started small. Mom would forget to wash my clothes, so I had nothing clean to wear to school. I'd show up in wrinkled, stained clothes, feeling embarrassed as the other kids whispered and pointed. Then there was the food situation. Mom would make fancy meals for her and Jack, filling the house with delicious smells, but when I'd come to the table, she'd say, oh, Cheryl, I'm sorry. I didn't make enough for three. Why don't you make yourself a sandwich? So, I'd go to the kitchen, stomach growling, and make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I could hear mom and Jack laughing in the dining room, the sound of clinking wine glasses making my simple meal feel even smaller. The worst part was when she started messing with my schoolwork. I'd spend hours working on a project, only for it to go missing the next morning. I'd show up to school empty-handed, struggling to explain to the teacher what happened. My grades started to drop, and my teachers looked at me with worried eyes. Through all of this, Jack didn't seem to notice. He was always busy with work, and when he was home, his attention was all on mom. She played the loving wife perfectly. Jack, darling, you work so hard, she'd say, rubbing his shoulders. You deserve a break. He'd look up at her with a smile, totally captivated. What would I do without you, Isabella, he'd say. Things got worse when mom announced she was pregnant. Jack was thrilled, and mom made the most of it. The doctor says I need lots of rest, she'd tell me, lying on the couch. Be a dear and tidy up the house, won't you? I spent my afternoons cleaning while mom took naps or chatted with friends on the phone. When Jack came home, she'd slowly get up, holding her barely there baby bump. Oh, honey, I'm so tired, she'd say. Growing a baby is hard work. 
Jack would rush over, worried, saying, sit down, my love. Cheryl, bring your mother some water. As the months went by, I felt more and more alone. I started pulling away from my friends at school, too ashamed to invite them over to my house. At home, I felt like a stranger. I was more like a servant, expected to do whatever mom wanted. One night, I was in bed, listening to mom and Jack excitedly talking about nursery designs, and something inside me snapped. I couldn't handle it anymore. I needed to get out. With shaky hands, I picked up my phone and did something I had never dared to do before, I called my dad and told him everything, the neglect, the mind games, the constant feeling of being unwanted. Dad listened quietly, the only sound his breathing letting me know he was still there. When I finally stopped talking, there was a long silence. Then he said, pack your bags. I'm coming to get you. His voice was firm and serious. The next morning, I got up early, my heart beating fast with a mix of excitement and fear. I had already packed my bags the night before, too anxious to sleep. As I dragged my suitcase down the stairs, I heard mom's voice coming from the kitchen. Going somewhere, Cheryl, she asked. I froze, expecting a big fight. But when I turned around, I saw her leaning against the doorway with a strange smile on her face. I'm going to live with dad, I said, my voice stronger than I felt. To my surprise, mom's smile grew even wider. Well, it's about time, she said, almost cheerfully. Jack and I could use the extra space for the baby. Her words hit me hard, like a slap in the face. Before I could say anything, I heard a car horn outside. Dad was here. Mom walked me to the door, that unsettling smile still on her face. Have a good life, Cheryl, she said, almost pushing me out the door. As I walked to Dad's car, I glanced back. Mom was standing in the doorway, actually happy, waving goodbye. It was the happiest I'd seen her in years, and it was because I was leaving. Dad's apartment was small, but it felt more like home than any place I had lived in a long time. We didn't stay there for long, though. Over the next few months, I watched in amazement as Dad's business took off. It seemed like every week he had good news, a new contract, a big client, or plans to expand. Within a year, we were looking at houses in the best neighborhoods in the city. The house we bought was incredible, two stories of modern design with huge windows and a backyard that looked like something out of a magazine. My room was bigger than our entire old apartment. Dad worked long hours, managing his now successful business, and I put my energy into turning our big house into a real home. I learned to cook fancy meals, filling the house with delicious smells. I kept everything clean, managed the staff, and even started a vegetable garden in the big backyard. As the months went by, everything began to change. I watched as dad's hard work kept paying off, and our life got even better. I transferred to the best private school in the city, and on my 18th birthday, dad gave me a huge surprise, a brand new luxury SUV. Now you can drive yourself to school in style, he said with a smile, tossing me the keys. And maybe run some errands for your old man. As I got used to my new life, I thought about mom less and less. She never reached out to me, and I didn't try to contact her or any of my relatives on her side. The hurt was still too fresh, and the memories were too painful. Instead, I focused on my studies. Years passed, and before I knew it, I was graduating from college with honors. As I stood on the stage, holding my diploma, I looked out into the crowd for dad. He was there, smiling with pride, and for a moment, I forgot to breathe. This was what it felt like to be truly loved. After the ceremony, dad pulled me aside with a grin. I have something for you, he said, his eyes shining. He handed me a small box. Inside was a key. It's for your new apartment in the city center. Consider it a graduation gift. Tears filled my eyes as I hugged him tightly. Thank you, dad, for everything. A few years went by after I graduated from college. My career was going well, I had a beautiful apartment in the city, and life was good. Dad and I had settled into a comfortable routine, weekly dinners and long phone calls. Everything seemed perfect until it wasn't. 
The news hit like a lightning bolt on a sunny day. Dad was sick, cancer. Advanced. The doctor's words blurred into a mix of medical terms, but the main point was clear, it was serious. From that moment on, my world became all about saving dad. I took a break from work and moved back into his house to take care of him. Every moment of my day was focused on his care. I researched treatments, talked to specialists, and even looked into alternative therapies, anything that might give us a chance. The following months were a tough mix of hope and despair. For every good day when dad felt well enough to sit outside or enjoy a meal, there were three bad ones, full of pain and sickness from the treatments. One evening, after a particularly hard day, I was helping him back to bed. He turned to me with a serious expression. Cheryl, he said softly, his voice just above a whisper. I need you to promise me something. I nodded, unable to speak because of the lump in my throat. Promise me you'll live your life, Dad said. Really live it. Don't let this hold you back. I wanted to argue, to tell him he was going to be fine, but we both knew that wasn't true. So, instead, I squeezed his hand and said, I promise, Dad. He passed away three weeks later. I was holding his hand when he took his last breath, telling him how much I loved him and how grateful I was for everything he had done for me. The next few days were a blur. I felt numb as I went through the motions of arranging the funeral. There were so many things to take care of, the casket, the flowers, the obituary. It all felt unreal, like I was planning something for someone else. I was at the funeral home, trying to choose music for the service, when my phone buzzed. The call was from an unknown number. I almost didn't answer, but something made me pick up. Hello, Cheryl, it's, it's your mother. I nearly dropped the phone. After all these years of silence, she was calling now. What do you want? I asked, my voice cold. I heard about Harold, she said, her voice softer than I remembered. I'm so sorry, sweetie. I'd like to help with the funeral arrangements. I wanted to hang up, to tell her to leave me alone, but I was so tired, so overwhelmed, and a small part of me, a part one thought I had buried long ago, longed for a mother's comfort. Okay, I heard myself say. You can help. As I ended the call, I had a nagging feeling that I had just opened a door I should have kept closed. But with dad gone, mom was the only family I had left. Mom showed up at the funeral home an hour after the call, with my half-brother, Brian. He was about 15 now, tall and awkward. I watched as his mom fussed over him, straightening his tie and smoothing his hair. It hurt, seeing her shower Brian with the care and attention I had never received. What do you need me to do, she asked. Despite my hesitation, I gave her tasks to handle. To my surprise, mom was actually helpful. She managed the catering, arranged the flowers, and dealt with the constant flow of people offering their condolences. The funeral itself went by in a haze. I remember standing there, numb, as people I barely knew came up to offer their sympathy. Mom stayed close, her hand sometimes touching my arm, as if to comfort me. It felt strange to have her there, acting like a mother after so many years of neglect. After the service, when people were leaving the cemetery, mom came up to me again. Cheryl, she said. I know this might not be the right time, but I'd like to stay in touch. Maybe we could get coffee sometime. I stared at her, this woman who had made my childhood so difficult, who had been happy to see me leave. But now, she was the only family I had left. Maybe, I said at last. I'll think about it. To my surprise, Isabella actually kept her word. In the weeks that followed, she called me often, her voice always full of concern. How are you doing, sweetie, she'd ask. Do you need anything? At first, I was distant, giving short answers, not trusting her. But as the days went by, and I started feeling the weight of dad's absence, I found myself wanting some kind of connection, even if it was with Isabella. Our conversations started simple. She asked about my job, my apartment, my friends. But over time, her questions began to shift. Your father's business, she mentioned casually. I hope it's not too much for you. 
Harold always worked so hard. I would quickly change the subject. The truth was, I was overwhelmed. Dad had left me everything, the company, the real estate. It was a lot to handle, and deep down, some part of me, sharpened by years of dealing with Isabella, told me to stay quiet about it. As the weeks turned into months, Isabella's hints became less subtle. Brian is looking at colleges, she said during one call. Tuition is so expensive these days. I don't know how we'll manage. I made a non-committal sound, my guard instantly up. Another time, she said, Jax had some setbacks at work. The economy is hitting everyone hard. It seemed like every conversation turned into a talk about money and their struggles, and each time, I felt the pressure in her words. Despite my doubts, Isabella's sudden acts of kindness began to break down my defenses. Against my better judgment, I started to help out with small amounts of money. It started innocently, paying for Brian's SAT prep classes, buying Isabella a new laptop when hers broke, even covering a month's rent when Jack's company hit a rough patch. You're an angel, Cheryl, Isabella would say. I don't know what we'd do without you. Each time she said it, I felt a warmth inside me. Was this what it was like to have a real family? Meanwhile, I threw myself into running dad's company. I promoted his trusted deputy to director while I remained the owner, making all the big decisions. It was hard work, but sitting in dad's old office made me feel closer to him. As time went on, Isabella's requests became more frequent and bigger. What started as occasional help turned into regular expectations. The breaking point came one sunny Sunday afternoon. I was knee-deep in quarterly reports when Isabella called. Cheryl, darling, she began, her voice overly sweet. We've been thinking. It's been so long since we had a proper family vacation. We found this amazing package deal for a European tour. My stomach dropped. Isabella, I don't know, I started to say. It would mean so much to Brian, she cut me off. After all we've been through, don't you think we deserve a little happiness? I felt guilt mixed with anger in my chest, and before I knew it, I had agreed to pay for their trip. But it didn't end there. The day after they got back, Isabella was on the phone again, now about Brian's college fund. She said this time, her tone was demanding, not sweet. We'll need you to set that up right away. He's got his heart set on board town. Something inside me snapped. No, I said, my voice shaking. No more, mom. I'm done. There was a pause, then Isabella's voice turned cold. After everything we've done for you, you ungrateful brat. How dare you turn your back on your family. I let out a bitter laugh. Family? You mean the mother who was happy to see me go? The one who made my childhood miserable? The argument exploded. Isabella dropped any pretense of kindness, throwing insults and accusations. I fought back, years of anger and pain spilling out. You're just like your father, she spat. Selfish and cold-hearted. Thank God for that, I shot back. At least he loved me. The line went dead. I stood there, shaking, the phone clutched in my hand. The silence was overwhelming. When a chance for a month-long business trip abroad came up, I grabbed it. It was the perfect escape, a chance to get away and clear my head. As I boarded the plane, I felt a huge weight lift from my shoulders. Maybe some time and distance was exactly what I needed. After a month away, I was eager to get back to my own space. The trip had been successful but exhausting, and I couldn't wait to relax in my apartment. But when I turned the key in the lock, something felt wrong. I pushed the door open, and my heart sank. Everything was different. My carefully chosen furniture was gone, replaced by decorations I didn't recognize. A shocked couple stared at me from the couch. Who are you? I demanded, panic rising. What are you doing in my apartment? The man stood up, looking confused. Your apartment? We bought this place a couple of weeks ago from a woman named Isabella. The world spun around me. Isabella? My mother? 
No, it couldn't be. There had to be some mistake. I stood there, my voice shaking. I never sold this apartment till I've been out of the country. The couple looked at each other, clearly worried. We have all the paperwork, the woman said, sounding unsure. Maybe you should talk to your realtor. I stumbled out of the apartment, my mind spinning. My first thought was to call the police and report a fraud, but something inside told me to confront mom first. I needed to hear it from her own mouth. With trembling fingers, I dialed her number. It rang once, twice. Hello, Cheryl, mom's voice was overly sweet. How was your trip? Cut the nonsense, mom, I snapped. What did you do to my apartment? There was a long pause, and then, to my shock, Isabella laughed, a cold, mocking laugh. Oh, Cheryl, she said, her voice dripping with fake sympathy. If you had just shared your money willingly, it wouldn't have come to this. You did this to yourself, you know. It felt like a punch in the stomach. You. You sold my apartment? How could you? I'm going to the police. Oh, really? Isabella interrupted, her voice suddenly hard. You're going to report your own mother? Please, we both know you don't have the guts for that. The call ended abruptly, leaving me standing on the sidewalk, homeless and in shock. But her smug confidence lit a fire in me. Without thinking, I hailed a cab and told the driver to take me to Isabella and Jack's house. I pounded on the door, anger and adrenaline racing through me. Jack answered, looking confused. Cheryl, what's going on? I pushed past him into the house. Where's Isabella? I demanded. She's not here, he said, looking even more bewildered. Cheryl, what is this about? In a rush, I told him everything, the apartment, Isabella's confession, all of it. As I spoke, I saw the color drain from Jack's face. That's impossible, he said, stunned. We don't need money for Brian's education. I've already set aside funds for that. We stared at each other, the truth slowly sinking in. With shaky hands, Jack started pulling out financial statements and credit card bills. As we went through them, the full story came out. Mom had secretly taken out loans and was drowning in debt, I had no idea, Jack whispered, looking shocked. I felt a strange mix of anger and pity. Jack had been just as deceived as I was. As the full extent of Isabella's lies came to light, a cold determination settled over me. This wasn't just about me anymore. This was outright fraud. I knew what I had to do, and I didn't hesitate. I hung up with the 111 operator, feeling like a huge weight had been lifted off my shoulders. For too long, I had been mom's victim, but not anymore. The investigation that followed was tough, but it had to be done. Every detail uncovered showed more of Isabella's lies. She hadn't just forged my signature to sell my apartment, she had been living a double life. The credit card statements showed fancy clothes, luxury spa visits, and stays at seven-star hotels, all of it was kept secret from Jack and all of it was paid through a web of lies and hidden loans. The trial turned into a media frenzy, with reporters crowding outside the courthouse, desperate for any bit of gossip. I hated being in the spotlight, but a part of me was glad to see Isabella's perfect image fall apart for everyone to see. In the end, justice was served. Mom was found guilty of everything, fraud, forgery, and more. The judge's words still echo in my mind. Mrs. Isabella Sermon, your actions show a complete disregard for the law and a betrayal of your family's trust. I sentence you to four years in prison and order you to repay the full value of the apartment to Cheryl Shuren. Jack was in shock throughout the whole thing. The day after the sentencing, he called me. Cheryl, he said, his voice shaky. I'm filing for divorce, and I'm seeking full custody of Brian. After what she's done, I can't let her be around him. Afterward, I started rebuilding my life once again. The money from the apartment was returned to me, and I used it to buy a small house on the edge of the city, a fresh start. I put my energy into running dad's company, doing my best to honor his legacy. The work was challenging, 
but it felt good, and for the first time, I felt like I was really standing on my own. Brian and I stay in touch. He's in college now, studying engineering, with Jack's full support. It's a bittersweet connection, but I'm happy we have some sort of relationship. As for Isabella, I haven't heard from her since the trial. I don't know if she's tried to reach out, and honestly, I don't want to know. That part of my life is over.